We are looking at some new laws being discussed and some about to be passed by Iowa lawmakers, including a bill heading to Governor Reynolds' desk that will ban vaccine passports, passports which keeps companies and government entities from being able to require proof of vaccinations from employees. Bennett Smith is a political science instructor at North Iowa Community College and our political analyst from the Hawkeye State. Bennett, how big of a fight or debate did this become within the Iowa legislature? Well, it's certainly a debate, Bessie, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I think it's really kind of a non-issue. Uh, Republicans are supporting it, and the governor wants to kind of take a stand on the issue. But frankly, uh, there's not a lot of uh, people clamoring for uh, vaccine passports that I can tell. So I think it's a little bit of a red herring, honestly. Okay, well, Governor Reynolds is not taking the $95 million federal funding for COVID testing within the school system throughout Iowa. I do know that that was more of a debate. That's exactly right. And I think uh, along partisan lines, so Democrats felt like that we should take the, the money and do more with testing and tracing, contact tracing in schools. Um, and the governor felt like um, we didn't need the money, that we had other resources to do that. So that was a, a more of a partisan debate. I, I think what kind of put it a little over the top is the way in which the governor um, went on Fox News uh, earlier in the week and basically said, we don't want it. And it's kind of the way she rejected it that I think um, has a lot of Iowans kind of wondering why the need to do that. Before, before she went on and, and said this on the forum that she did, had this been a point that people had known about, did lawmakers know that the $95 million was coming and that she was saying no? Well, I think that's part of the issue. I, my understanding is that they didn't know the week before. And so I think that was part of the uh, issue there. Uh, but there can be fundamental disagreements about taking that money. Um, I know there were some strings attached to it. And so I think that's a very legitimate kind of partisan debate to have. But I think what impacted the issue more broadly is just the way that the governor handled that, because then it looks more like a political stunt, um, when in reality, we, we should all be pulling together here to, again, attack this pandemic and make sure that our kids are vaccinated and so on and so forth. So I think that's what kind of stirred the pot a bit on that issue is kind of the way it was handled. The vaccination rates in Iowa are uh, high, but yes. leveling off just as they are in other states, including in Minnesota. Uh, anything further coming out of the legislature about vaccination rates and uh, the, the latest, I guess, with COVID? Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting to see that, uh, you know, we've had, I think, recently about 80 counties in Iowa out of our 99 refuse uh, new shipments of the vaccine just because of lack of demand. Now, having said that, we have had some real good success, particularly with uh, folks who are 65 and older, and uh, we're hoping to gain even more traction. Um, I know the governor, and this is a bipartisan issue where people are working together to try and get more Iowans vaccinated, and hopefully we can continue to pursue that. I know that uh, Governor Reynolds is less restrictive with her mandates statewide than what we see from Governor Walls in Minnesota. Has there been much of the comparison as Republicans there in Iowa say, well, this is what's happening in Minnesota? Because I know in, in Minnesota, they, uh, Republicans look to South Dakota and Iowa to try to get Governor Walls to ease up on restrictions. Does that happen at all there? Right. Yeah, I think there's been tension in both states on that and robust debates about, you know, early on in the pandemic, uh, the issue of a mask mandate and, and various parts of this. So, yeah, there's definitely some tension over that. And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, when you have a crisis like a pandemic, you can't have this kind of partisan divide. Everybody's got to pull together. Otherwise, it has really tragic consequences. And unfortunately, we've seen that in Iowa. I think we could have done better at certain things um, had we been more aggressive in the very early part of the pandemic.
I think it was a learning curve, though, for everybody, including our lawmakers, as they were trying to navigate all the information coming out from the federal level, from our local health officials and whatnot. Um, Bennett, if I can keep you for just a couple of minutes, we're going to take sure. a quick break. When we come back, there's a movement when it comes to charter schools, how that will affect public schools, and then the economy in Iowa. Give me two minutes. We'll, good. we'll come back and talk about that. I'm continuing my conversation now with Bennett Smith, who is a political science instructor, as well as our political analyst from Iowa. And Bennett, there's new ways to establish charter schools in Iowa that has passed uh, part, partly in the legislature and has the support of Governor Reynolds. Opponents say this is going to be a financial blow to public schools. Tell me where this issue stands now, what the latest is with it. That's right. It's still, uh, you know, awaiting a decision by the governor. But, uh, you know, Republicans, including Governor Reynolds, wanted to provide, you know, more opportunity and choice in this matter to establish charter schools to, you know, compete and perhaps, you know, that competition would improve the public schools and give parents choice. On the opposite side, the Democrats have been uh, robustly against this for the reason you mentioned, the fact that it's uh, draining money away. Uh, from the public schools and their argument is that's money that you know we should be spending to improve those public schools so um, we're just kind of in limbo this week they're trying to finalize a bunch of things and so um, but I believe that if she hasn't signed that uh, already she will help me with this particular issue a little bit more understand uh, the opponent's point of view on it um, lack of funding for public schools is a really broad uh, way of, of putting how this will hurt the public schools in Iowa because uh, more people would say whether no matter which side of the aisle you sit on that more choice is good well, I think the, the argument, yeah, it could be made either way. I think there's a, a lot of choices that people have in Iowa right now, whether it's public or private schools. A lot of districts have open enrollment, for example, Betsy. Um, I think, you know, the perception is that, you know, if is there really a need to add more additional charter schools? And then I believe they change the mechanism by which those can be established as opposed to going simply through the local uh, school board to get approval, they can go directly through the state. So I think that's caused some tension as well. Let's talk about unemployment and the economy in Iowa. Things are looking very good in yeah. that uh, it's almost to the level pre-pandemic. Um, but unemployment is something that while low unemployment numbers are good for the economy, we do have a lot of people still out of work uh, a lot of people, what we're understanding now by choice, because they are uh, getting the unemployment benefits, and that is hurting the private and the public sector. That's a good point, Betsy. It's really a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, the, you know, the rescue plan that was put forward that provided extended unemployment benefits for a, you know, different areas of the economy in different states were you know, really in need of that. Other places like Iowa, uh, not so much, perhaps, because our desperate need is for qualified workforce. And so, you know, the, the issue that uh, we struggle with is uh, not enough population growth, not enough qualified workforce. And so, for example, we work really hard in North Iowa to recruit people and improve our communities, and that's where I'm from. Um, but no, that's a persistent issue. Now, I will tell you another issue that we're struggling with here. And frankly, everybody around the country is inflation. The price of uh, lumber, steel, other commodities, uh, you know, are really impacting a people's ability to carry out some projects. So on the Fed, be Bennett, on the federal level, uh, is it being blamed on inflation? Because what I'm hearing is more so it's being blamed on the pandemic, supply and demand. And that's what this you know, is boils down to when it when I talk to federal lawmakers. Yeah, that's a great point, Betsy. I think it's a, a debate right now. At least the Federal Reserve has adopted that position that the trans the inflation we're seeing right now is perhaps transitory because, as you said, you had pandemic shutdowns, and now with the rollout of the vaccine and other things, you're seeing a, a red hot economy. Frankly, as Warren Buffett said the other day at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. Um, but the problem is you don't have the production capacity 
to kind of catch up. And that's creating, like you said, supply chain problems and other choke points in the economy. Um, I'll give you one simple example. I went and tried to buy a trailer the other day and they were all sold out and they weren't going to get any more for like 25 weeks. Mm. And the price had went up 500 bucks from last year. So these are the kinds of things that consumers and businesses are dealing with and it could become a real problem uh, here going forward if we're not careful. Okay, so the population not growing at a rapid rate in Iowa, but the census numbers uh, tell us that y'all get to keep the four congressional seats. So that's got to be some good news. And, and if the population isn't growing, are you surprised that you didn't lose any of those seats? Yeah, that was really good news. Uh, we, we grew enough. I think it was 4.7%. Uh, um, and frankly, it was great in Minnesota. You know, you guys uh, managed to keep your eighth seat, if I remember that right. And that is right. Um, you know, they did a great job with the census uh, up there. And uh, so, yeah, we were fortunate. We grew enough to keep that uh, fourth seat. And that's really important. Uh, by way of comparison, uh, back in the 1980s, when I was going through school, uh, we had six congressional representatives. So that gives you some idea of the population shift away from Iowa. And again, uh, we have the ability to grow economically here, I think much faster than we are if we had the qualified workforce along any number of skill levels. Remember remember way back in the day with Ross Perot and his phrase, the great sucking sound, and he was talking, <laughs> right. about, he was talking about Mexico sucking U.S. workers. I can't right. believe that there isn't that sucking sound coming from Iowa because Iowa not only is a great state, uh, but there's so many incentives for companies to build and grow and to bring employees there that I'm surprised that there isn't more growth. Yeah, and that's, I think, you know, an issue that uh, policymakers in Des Moines on both sides of the aisle, you know, are working to address that. Um, but that's difficult because Iowa doesn't have some of the natural advantages that other states do. Um, like a Colorado or California or Minnesota, for example, with the 10,000 lakes. You know, so we've got to work harder, in my view, at uh, quality of life initiatives uh, that can draw people here. Well, you know? well, I find some of the friendliest people in Iowa. So yeah. I, 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 do, I do like uh, being in Iowa, covering stories and talking to uh, politicians and you, of course, my political friend. I always <laughs> appreciate talking to you. Sure. Well, we love having you down here, Betsy. And uh, yes, it is a great environment to raise a family and high quality educational systems like Minnesota does as well. Bennett, I always appreciate your insight. It has been far too long. We will not wait this long again before we talk to you. Sounds good. I always enjoy it, Betsy. Nice to talk to you today. All righty. We'll be right back.